Craig Malewski, and uh, I'm going to talk about the historical changes in the fish community in Lower St. Regis Lake, which is about uh, 25, 30 minute drive from here, and just simply ask the question, what does it all mean? Uh, this actually is a, a, a picture of, of Lower St. Regis Lake, and I'll, you can see the taller trees there in the center, that's called um, St. Regis Point at the time. The date of the picture is unknown, but, but obviously before there was much development on the lake. So the purpose of this presentation is fairly straightforward, share an understanding of how shifts in fish communities weave into the historical narrative of changes in Lower St. Regis Lake, and ask a simple question, can a largely non-indigenous fish community be used to assess the recovery of a lake that has been substantially altered by things like hydrologic, uh, hydrologic alteration, water quality, introduced species, angling, and uh, put a question mark there by climate change, not that it's not a variable, but uh, Compared with all the others, it might be very hard to uh, disentangle it. Uh, so Lower St. Regis Lake is, is here or in Franklin County. It's, it's part of a chain of lakes, the St. Regis chain of lakes that includes Spitfire and Upper St. Regis Lake, and uh, eventually flows into the St. Regis River. Ahead, uh, let's see, it's about 350 acres and the maximum depth of 35 feet. Um, so this is a, a picture of where the college is located now. Uh, this was uh, Paul Smith's uh, resort that started in the late 1850s, early 1860s, and of course this no longer exists. Um, now there's the college, and uh, much of the environmental programs at Paul Smith's College really got their a big start around 1972 as a result of the Clean Water Act and some problems with uh, water quality, of course, in the United States. Um, so how to, it, it took us a while really to kind of piece things together. Um, but an interesting uh, story, actually. So some of the sources for understanding ships and fish community include historical accounts, fish stocking records, and fish surveys, um, and what to determine what the native fish communities were and, and what the emerging fish community is becoming. So in 1860, uh, this author by the name of William Prime wrote this book called I Go A Fishing. And 1860, this is two years after Paul Smith uh, bought this property, and from an old guy, I learned that brook trout were abundant in one part of the pond close by the house. And that's that yellow dot there. Fish rose in every cast, and when they had half a dozen of the same sort, a little less than two pounds, and one that lacked only an ounce of being four pounds, we pulled up the killick and piled homer. And uh, in, in that story, too, he describes how uh, they paddled about 100 strokes with a guide, and they got around this point, that, that island point there. And uh, what was interesting, it describes how the wind came up and lifted the uh, um, lily pads. So you know it wasn't an early spring or late fall. Um, just another one, 1872. I looked out across the lake to Peter's Rock and wondered whether the trout would rise to fly over there as in other years. So this is prior to any stocking. But what did the stocking records for Lower St. Regis suggest? Uh, one, perhaps a response to heavy fishing pressure for brook trout, and uh, maybe eventually throwing in the towel on cold water species. In 1974, late largemouth bass were actually stopped. And it might be uh, no surprise that fishing pressure could have been fairly heavy. Uh, let's see, the data known that first picture, the mid 1880s, and by 1903, um, let's see, 1903, there was 255 rooms. 17 cottages, two employee dormitories, stable for 60 horses, seven bathhouses, two laundry facilities, a store, a sawmill, and a golf course. It's a lot different uh, now, of course. So I don't know how many people came there to fish, but even if a uh, quarter of those people fished out on the lake, I suspect that they may have had a significant impact. Um, some of the field surveys, the earliest one that uh, we could look at was, is 1930. Uh, then 1970, 1980, and then 2004 to present. 2004 is when our Fish and Wildlife Science Program started, and that's also when we started doing some long-term monitoring on the lake. And this uh, gives you an example of uh, what kind of gears were used as well. Um, in the 1930 New York State EDC survey report, um, they categorized the lake, they, they admitted it was rough, they categorized the lake three ways. Deep lakes, assumed to support oxygen, demanding cold water fishes, shallow warm water lakes only supporting only warm water fishes and uh, shallow cold water lakes with some cold water species persisting during the warm summer months, most often spring fed 
uh, refuges. Um, Lower St. Regis Lake was not classified itself. The Spitfire right next to it was. They did share a similar depth. In the surveys, they had very similar fish communities. And I, I just broadly broke out the fishes too in uh, assemblages, cold water, cool water, and, warm, and a few warm water species. So what did that actually look like? So the fish species composition survey in 1930, you can argue a little bit about where exactly these fit, fit, fish fit on the continuum. Um, but anyways, these are the fishes that existed in the 1930 survey. Now lake trout are included in here along with lake whitefish and um, I understand that whitefish were often stocked with lake trout as a, uh, a food, food fish for them. But the long nose sucker existed, um, many different species of cyprinids and a few warm water species. In 1971 and 1973, there, uh, obviously the fish community uh, began a, a pretty dramatic shift. All the middle species were gone. One middle species was surveyed in the lake and that was the golden china. Uh, 1986, um, this was of course after the Clean Water Act and uh, some efforts made to improve uh, uh, phosphorus input into the lake. Uh, northern pike were found. Um, let's see, what I did want to say, I forgot to say here, is that in 1971 73, the white sucker were the dominant species in the surveys. In 1986, um, white suckers were also dominant. And in uh, 2004, we, we, don't, we do not catch very many white suckers anymore, but you can start to see the assemblages, assemblage has shifted uh, toward warm water species. Um, four of the seven native species that were found in 1930 are still present in Heron Marsh. Occasionally, sampled outside the standardized survey, uh, a brook trout is caught uh, sometime early spring below Shingle Mills Falls when we're uh, sampling in ichthyology. Um, Doing, doing some electrofishing as part of the test, I guess. Now here's a timeline. I don't expect us, I'm not gonna spend much time on here, but the red dots represent uh, where some of the fish information was obtained. Um, let's see, stocking of fish started in 1887. Uh, a dam was first built, let's see, in 1896, and then, then it was uh, increased in size and height. Um, the homeowners in 1903, 1902 said there's problems with the lake. There's a problem with the lake here. We're starting to turn green. Um, and let's see, Clean Water Act 77 made stricter regulations on wastewater. And then in 2004, we picked up on, on the long-term monitoring. We still have some other issues in the lake, but uh, the altered hydrologic regime. I wonder about that sometimes. First, there is a loss of connectivity, and you can see uh, the. Um, Press the right button here. Uh, this is the old river channel. The dam's right here. And it is probably about eight feet plus or minus, maybe approaching 10 feet high. It doesn't mean that it raised the lake that high. But um, uh, one, of the one of our students, uh, uh, Bob, decided, they said, what would this lake, what might the boundaries or edges of this lake look like prior to uh, placement of the dams? And so the pre-settlement conditions may have come close to the picture on the right. And you can see now the uh, lake higher, there's a lot more shallow areas. Um, I don't know how that might affect uh, the thermal regime at all. Uh, but one thing we do not know is how much annual or seasonal variation in water level there was, uh, or how what kind of effect this may have had on fish population and community dynamics. We'll make some guesses, I'm sure. Um, we do know that um, there's still shoreline erosion occurring as a result. Um, we ask the question sometimes, how has this influenced uh, short organic uh, matter retention to the shorelines? And about 10 years ago, that, that, fit, that picture in the, or that white pine in the upper uh, picture was standing tall and green and uh, uh, we're starting to get some trees falling in some certain areas into the lake. This is what the, what the lake looked like uh, from the air in, on August 5, 1971. There's clearly um, a problem with uh, total phosphorus coming into the lake. And the, the algae bloom could be seen, I think it was like 30 kilometers downstream from the lake. Um, but the water quality is improving. Uh, transparency is increasing. This is from 1965 to 2015. Uh, Corey Laxon put this together. Um, chlorophyll age appears to be declining along with total phosphorus. Total phosphorus definitely has 
and the lake appears to be moving from eutrophic conditions to mesotrophic conditions. So that's a, a positive. However, uh, dissolved oxygen uh, and the temperature, uh, temperature profiles, you can look at this and see that this would be an issue for cold water species. So um, cold water, um, of course, is going to be uh, throughout the water column in the spring, but in, in the summer months, July, August, and September, um, even though there's cold water um, in the hypolimnium, uh, the water, for the oxygen is completely depleted, less than less than one part per million. So uh, makes it uh, not suitable for cold water species. Um, just to pick up on what has recently been found in the lakes, um, I, I'm not going to present a whole lot of information on uh, population care, population um, uh, structures and rate functions of the fish communities, but I do want to know that uh, we have been noting, even in the last, since 2004, we've noticed, noticed some changes. Um, and this should be presented a little bit differently, but it's, it, it is what it is for now. Uh, the total catch from six nets, uh, six nets, so it still gives you a rel relative sense. I think one year we had five nets that one was tampered with. But in 2012, um, we found our first uh, population of black crappie, and their numbers seem to be doing well. Um, anglers like that. But we have seen a drop in the brown bullheads. We've seen an increase in some other species like the yellow perch, although I wonder what's going to happen with that now with the black crappie in the lake. But it's, it's just a different fish community than what it was entirely. And what one could ask the question, is, is it really ever going to become a cold water fisheries again? Um, I, I would suspect uh, less, not too likely. Um, and this is just an example of, of this uh, black crappie population. It has been increasing over time. With the exception of that one outlier there, cold front came through and shut down our net catches that year. Um, it, it shows a typical population growth curve. We'll, we'll, we'll see what, if that continues. But at the same time, um, what I find interesting is that just like uh, things seem to come full circle, um, probably like the brook trout had high fishing pressure uh, in the latter part of the 18th or 18th, 1800s, 19th century. Um, fishermen pick up very quickly on this and it certainly seems that they've uh, taken large numbers of black crappie. Anyways, um, so back to the second question. Can a largely non-indigenous fish community be used to assess the recovery of a lake that has been substantially offered, altered? I could answer that question, yes, but at a, at a cost, and I think a cost not fully realized uh, by people in the present. So it's recovered or recovering water quality, aesthetics, uh, the lake is, uh, had it recovered, I think the water is becoming more clear. Um, recreational fishing has recovered, uh, even though it's not the, the original fish that were there. Um, I would say, I would put this out there, maybe an ethical relationship to the environment is starting to recover in this area as well. Some of the cost, uh, most certainly the cold water fisheries, the connectivity of more St. Regis Lake with uh, um, uh, St. Regis River, and uh, I would also say the inevitable qualities of what once existed. And so, with that, uh, I would I do want to acknowledge uh, all the students and fisheries techniques from 2004 to present. 